Well, good evening, folks, and let me welcome you again to another one of our broadcasts. Thank you for tuning in tonight, where normally on a Wednesday night we would have our Bible study and prayer meeting at the church. Uh, but as has been our custom this last uh, number of weeks, we've been meeting together for a time in God's Word. Uh, just a, a thought for the day, really. Nothing too deep, nothing too heavy. Just something to encourage our hearts and then to uh, set us up for prayer. Uh, and we're going to do that again tonight. And can I encourage you, uh, after we uh, do spend the time in God's Word, that you... Uh, do seek the Lord's face and spend that time in prayer. If it's not immediately after the service, we do encourage you uh, to spend that time, uh, a set time as we would do each week in church, aside for uh, prayer for our church fellowship. Now, thank you for tuning in this evening. We're coming to Psalm number 42 tonight. Psalm number 42 and I want to uh, just bring a word of comfort and a word of encouragement and really the title for this evening's message is hope for cast down hearts hope for cast down hearts so that's what we're going to look at this evening from uh, this very familiar psalm uh, psalm number 42 so let's read it together and we know the Lord will bless the reading of his word. It says, As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my meat day and night, while they continually say unto me, Where is thy God? When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I had gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God, and the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept holy day. Why art thou cast down, O my soul, and why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. O oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and of the Hemorites uh, from the hill of Mizar. Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of thy water sprouts. All thy waves and thy billows are gone over me. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. <clears throat> command his loving kindness in the daytime and in the night his song shall be with me and my prayer unto the God of my life. I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy as with a sword in my bones? Mine enemies reproach me while they say daily unto me, where is thy God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me. Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. Now let's just pause and pray and let's ask the Lord for his help as we come to consider his word. Our Father, we come to you this evening, another Wednesday night, Lord, with open Bibles and with open hearts, and we long that you, O oh Father, would speak to us from your word. We thank you, Father, that even though these are incredible times, and Lord, while none of us are enjoying this period of isolation and lockdown, we thank you, Father, that you have sustained us, you have strengthened us. We thank you that you have encouraged us through your word. It's incredible, Father, just how relevant your word is, even written so many thousands of years ago, and yet how applicable it is even for our circumstances today. Lord, you know the hearts of your people. You know those with cast down hearts, those with troubled hearts. Lord, those with bereaved hearts. And Lord, we pray you'll have a word in season for every heart tonight. And then a little later, Lord, as we would go to prayer, we ask that you would hear and answer. And that, Lord, that you would continue to lead us and bless us and guide us and guard us. And Lord, we do pray that you'll cleanse us afresh this evening from anything that would quench the Spirit, anything that has grieved the Spirit, anything that would hinder our study of your word this evening. Teach us wonderful things from your law, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
I don't know how you are feeling this evening. I know talking by uh, to some of you on the phone uh, yesterday and today, I know that maybe the novelty of lockdown is wearing off. And I think this is week number six or seven. I've talked to some people and they have said this is their eighth week that they've been in isolation. And uh, I know that the government is talking about announcing measures where some of these restrictions may be relaxed. But as we look out into the future, Really, there isn't much to comfort our hearts. As I asked you about how you're feeling, I wonder how you're feeling about church. You know, church has been such a big part of our Christian lives. And I wonder tonight, are you missing church? I wonder, do you long to be back in church already? I know some of you have been asking, Pastor, when are we going to be back in church? When do you think we'll be back? Is there any word of church reopening? And I know that there is a, a longing to be back in church. You know, it's discouraging not being able to be there. Maybe this whole lockdown situation is getting you down. You're feeling discouraged by lockdown. Well, tonight, praise God, we have got comfort from his word. Because here we have a psalm and a psalmist of sympathy. Now, as we read Psalm 42, we could have continued on to read Psalm 43 because uh, originally it's believed that Psalm 42 and 43 were all one psalm, and that's very evident by the fact that the main verse that's repeated in the psalm is verse 5 Why art thou cast down? We see it in verse 11 of verse 42 and or of chapter 42, and then we see it again in verse 5 of chapter 43. So we don't know how these two psalms got divided, but it's believed they were part or, or they were one in the original. The author, the actual author of this particular psalm, is unknown to us personally, but the little inscription in your Bible will tell you that it was written by one of the sons of Korah. Now he was a Levite and it was likely that this psalm was being written somewhere in exile by one of the sons of Korah. Now who were they? Well we don't have time to go into all of their history but suffice it to say we could class them as the worship leaders in the temple. You know the way there's many churches and they have uh, people who head up the music side of church life. Well, the sons of Korah were really uh, involved heavily in the musical aspect of temple worship. They were very heavily involved in worship. They were very heavily involved in leading the worship uh, in the temple. Now, judging from verse number four, it's possible that one of these sons of Korah may have been uh, a man who would have led pilgrims uh, to Jerusalem at certain holy day feasts to lead them in worship. But as he writes Psalm 42, he's not able to do that. He's not able to go to the house of God. Do you know, isn't it amazing, folks, that the word of God was written hundreds and thousands of years ago, and yet... There's portions that are so relevant to today's world. Did we ever think that we would find ourselves meeting virtually, missing church, not able to, to get to church, and then think, is there a passage in scripture that deals specifically with not being able to go to the house of God? And my, here it is, Psalm 42, one of the sons of Korah, verse four, he remembers going to the house of God, and now he's not able, and in verse number uh, two, he asked this question, when shall I appear before God? Now, that's not uh, a metaphor for dying. Uh, some people maybe have misunderstood this, that that's what it means. But think of the context. Where did the Jew appear before God? Where did the Levite appear before God? They appeared before God in the temple. You know, that's where he would have went to worship. This is where this man would have lived the bulk of his life. It's where he served. It's where he worshipped. And for whatever reason, he isn't able to go to the place of public worship. And so this son of Korah, whoever he was, he's in a very similar place to where you and I are this evening. And as a consequence, as he thinks about once being able to go to the house of God and worship and appear before God, as he thinks of all that he was able to do and now he's not able, his soul is cast down. Now as you read down through this psalm, 
you'll see the structure of it. Uh, you could say it's like a wrestling match. And the psalmist is wrestling with himself and he's wrestling with God. And he's wrestling with his despair and he's wrestling with his hope. He's wrestling with his fears. He's wrestling with his faith. And there's these two natures, you see, you and I who are Christians tonight. And you get all kinds of people in pulpits and they're so spiritual or they think they're spiritual. And they use all this language that, that really that, that they're superhuman. The reality is every Christian is a human. And while there's a spiritual side of us and while we've got a soul and why we're living for heaven, we're also humans and we think like humans and we've got human feelings. And that's so evident in Psalm 42. There's this very spiritual man. He was a worship leader. He was a man of of, of great respect and reverence for the Lord. He was a man who hoped in the Lord and yet at the same time his soul was cast down. I've heard people and I don't know where on earth they get it from but it's certainly absolute nonsense where they say that Christians should never get depressed, that Christians should never get down. It happens. And so if you're feeling down tonight, I have a word from you for you, a hope for cast down hearts from a psalm that is so very relevant to the circumstances we find ourselves in. We're going to think about three things. And in this psalm, he starts off in despair, but he ends on a note of hope. And I hope by the end of the tonight, maybe you've tuned in and your heart's down, your heart's discouraged. By the end, your heart will be uplifted and you'll have just that little bit of food that'll keep you going for the next number of days. Three things we're going to think about. Number one, I want us to consider, first of all, a horrible feeling. A horrible feeling. I'm really going to base my whole message tonight around verse number 11. And you'll see that verse number 11 is duplicated in verse 5 of chapter 43. It's also um, seen in verse verse 5 of chapter 42. So what I say could apply. But the first thing the psalmist says in verse 11 of chapter 42 is, Why art thou cast down O my soul and why art thou disquieted within me we find the psalmist cast down now that little phrase cast down literally means to be in despair it means to be at a low point we talk about being on a high you know he's on a high but we also talk about people being on a low and we all have highs and lows and here in psalm 42 the psalmist was in a low he's depressed He's dejected, he's de- he's in distress, he's discouraged. In fact, the word despair literally means the beginning of losing hope. And that's where this man was. He was beginning to lose hope. And you know, it's a horrible feeling. We all know what this is like. Maybe some more than others. Maybe some have struggled in a very personal way. And I don't want to deal with the whole subject of depression tonight. That's a massive subject. Uh, and I don't have either the qualifications. And it's not my remit tonight. But at some point or another, we all know what it's like to be cast down. And it's a horrible feeling. But as I've already said tonight, it's a human feeling. It's a horrible feeling, but it's a human feeling. Believers are not exempt from feeling discouraged and even depressed. Maybe you feel tonight, I shouldn't be feeling discouraged. I shouldn't be feeling depressed because I should be so spiritual that I should be above this. No. If that's the case, if you should never be discouraged, then you're better than some of God's greatest men. Some of God's greatest men find themselves cast down. Moses, Exodus chapter 5. Oh, he was on the high of bringing the children of Israel across the Red Sea. Then the children of Israel turn against Moses and he goes to the Lord and he says, Lord, why? He was at an end of himself. Elijah, one of the greatest prophets ever to have lived. He goes to the brook Cherith and he says, Lord, it's enough now. Just take my life. I'm depressed. What about John the Baptist? The great forerunner for Messiah. Some people thought he was the Messiah. He ends up, for all of his exploits, he ends up in prison. 
And he's so discouraged that he even sends those to ask, is this really the Messiah? Could he really have come? Look where I have ended up. I could go on. David was discouraged. Uh, the sons of Korah, this son of Korah was discouraged. There was many, many other people. Judah was discouraged. There was many of God's great people who found themselves discouraged. There's a sweet thought in the fact that even our Saviour times was cast down mainly as he looked at the lack of faith as he looked out across Jerusalem his heart was discouraged but you know as we think about even the saviour now you know how our saviour even though he was cast down he he still bears our our burden. You know, on the cross of Calvary, he bore our sins in his own body, 1 Peter 2 and 24. But here's the thing, remember, he also bore our sorrows. Isaiah 53 and verse 4 says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And here's the great comfort tonight, dear child of God, while maybe I can't sympathise with how you're feeling or anybody else can, we have a sympathetic saviour who has been touched with all the feelings of our infirmities and was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. He bore our sin in his own body, but praise God, he also bore our sorrows. He knows what it's like to be cast down and so you take comfort in that tonight that you have a sympathetic savior but why was the psalmist in despair well i've already hinted at it but look at uh, the verses here in verses one to four. First of all in in verses one and two it seemed that god was nowhere as the heart panteth after the water brook, so my so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? This the psalmist, as I say, is far from the temple. It's a the place of worship, and he therefore also feels that he's far from God. And so this is the first part. Why he's cast out? He feels because he can't go to the temple, then he's growing further apart from God. And so it seems that God is nowhere. And then in verse number three, uh, and also uh, in verse. Uh, number 10 we see that the enemies seem to be everywhere is not often what happens when God seems to be nowhere the enemy seems to be everywhere because he says my tears have been my meat day and night while they continually they that's his enemies continually say unto me where is thy God verse 10 as with a sword in my bones mine enemies reproach me while they daily say unto me where is thy God and so here while God seemed absent and nowhere the enemy seemed present and everywhere. Spurgeon says of those two things God hidden and foes raging a pair of evils enough to bring down the stoutest heart. Add to those two his mind and memories of better days were working against him. You know in verse 4 when I remember these things I pour out my soul in me for I had gone out with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise with the multitude that kept the holy day. He was looking back and he was remembering all that he had and it was working against him. It was making him grow ever more depressed as he contrasted the yesteryears of his present circumstances. Then to top it all off, in verse number 7, he was overwhelmed by the burden of his trials. He says, this is rising above my head. God was being slow in his eyes. And you know, so as the psalmist remembered these things, his soul was cast down within him. Oh, you know how we can experience these exact same feelings I wonder tonight, do you feel it? Are you losing a sense of God's presence in the monotony of lockdown? You're not able to get out. You're not able to get to church. And that is getting you down. You know, church, of course, anchors us. We know that God is always with us. We know that God is everywhere. And that's not what the psalmist is saying, that God only appeared in the temple. He knew that God was omnipresent. 
But you know, church is that thing that that serves as a focus point for our faith. It's the thing that keeps us going. We go on a Sunday for our food. We go on a Wednesday for our study and prayer. And it's that set thing in our lives. And it's the thing that the corporate worship, there's something special about that. And it tethers us. And, and as certainly as your pastor, as I as the pastor exhorts and encourages and challenges, we, we seek to live out what's being preached. And all of a sudden now, we're not able to go to church and it can see like we're we're growing a little bit further from God that the spiritual influence and influencers in our lives are not as present as they were and it can seem or we can feel that God is far from us and of course our minds can work against us as we contrast our circumstances with better memories of the past I don't know how many people have said to me pastor you know we we enjoy your services watching in but it's just not the same as church remembering the better days and contrasting with these days maybe we're wondering are we ever going to get back to normal are we ever going to be back in church is church going to be uh, is it going to be you know what's it going to be like the first time we're back we're longing for better days we could say that the enemy in our context is is coronavirus everywhere we look it's surrounding us it's all we're hearing on the news and It's just everywhere. And I wonder, is the virus crying out, where is thy God? And you know, we can all just become overwhelmed and our souls can so easily become cast down. Oh, that's a horrible feeling. But verse 11 goes on because not only do we have a horrible feeling, why art thou cast down, but we have a heavenly fix. Oh, we have a horrible feeling, but a heavenly fix, because as the psalmist wrestles about being cast down, he says, come on, catch a grip of yourself, man. He says, hope thou in God. There's the heavenly fix. You know, our heavenly fix is found in four words, hope thou in God. You just remember those, and when you're feeling cast down, just say them over to yourself. Now, I know that that remedy rolls so easily off the tongue, but it does work when we apply it to our lives with the spirit or with the spirit's help. James Montgomery Boyce calls these four words an upward look by a downcast soul, an upward look by a downcast soul. And as I say here, the psalmist is wrestling within himself here. He's fighting between hope and despair. And he's concluded that there's no point in looking around for hope. So he calls himself to look up for hope. Do you know it's actually more than a call? Our English language doesn't convey exactly what is said and meant in the word hope. The word hope here is a verb, but it's a, a command in the Hebrews, uh, in the Hebrew language. Uh, and what he's actually saying in a roundabout way, he says, preach hope to your heart. He's commanding his own heart. It's as if a spiritual man is preaching to his natural man. As if a spiritual man's the preacher and the natural man's in the pew. And he's saying, hope in God. Preach hope. I know that they say that talking to yourself is one of the first signs of madness, but it's not. When we're cast down, folks, talk to yourself about God. Remind yourself about the God who is in control. Remind yourself about the faithfulness of God. Recite the verse that you've memorized. Even those four words, hope thou in God. Even just sing a little chorus. Now when I, what I mean when I say hope in God, it doesn't mean crossing your fingers and really hoping that and sitting tight and hoping in some way God's going to help you out of this much more than that it's a no so hope it means being confident in God it means being content in God it means not detaching the God of the Bible with the God of our present circumstances it means encouraging ourselves that what we read of in the Psalms and the rest of the word of God applies to God today the same yesterday today and forever remember the weeks that we looked at Psalm 46 to 48 about uh, the, the surety of God and the sovereignty of God and the security of God carries the idea of waiting expectantly on God to work things out. I don't know. I believe the Lord's teaching me something in this because every passage I'm studying at the moment seems to have something about waiting on the Lord in it. 
you know, it was interesting because this idea, this word hope was actually used of Noah. If you go to Genesis chapter 8 and verse 12 and whenever the ark comes to rest on Arad and the waters begin to subside, it says in, in Genesis 8 and verse 12 that after Noah had sent out the dove and it came back, it said he stayed yet another seven days. That word stayed means he hoped in God another seven days. Imagine Noah, he's been on a boat for this length of time. He wants out of lockdown. And he sends out this bird and he thinks, let this bird please just stay away. And then the bird comes back and what did Noah do? He didn't despair. He hoped in God. And the verse goes on. He stayed yet another seven days and sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him any more. And he just had to wait it out. And in times like these, we need to keep hoping in the Lord, though the battle rages, the natural battle rages within us. Do you know there's a small South American tropical fish called Four Eyes. Uh, knows how to make the best of two worlds. His secret is in his large bulging eyes. They've been created uh, so that he can see above the water and below the water at the same time. And the fish does this by cru cruising along through the water with up the upper half of his eyes above the surface and this top half has an air lens and the bottom half has a water lens and together the two lenses outfit four eyes with a set of natural bifocals allowing him to see both the upper world and the underworld you know that's an amazing thing that that fish is being created with but you know we must look at life like that fish we've been given bifocals in our soul we live in the underworld. We see what's going on all around us. But we're under the governments of the upper world. And you know the Bible talks about spiritual eyes and natural eyes. With our natural eyes we see all around us. But don't forget we have spiritual eyes that can look above. And here's the thing, if you're cast down tonight, preach hope to your heart. Preach to yourself. The natural man needs reminded that though whatever way our, our natural eyes perceive the world, our spiritual eyes are telling us there's a God in heaven and faith tells us he's on the throne and everything is okay, that God is in complete control. Now I don't say all that flippantly. The writer to the Hebrews in Hebrews 6 and 11 says, We desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. In a hopeless world, what a blessing we can hope in God. The natural man ought, will despair because he has only eyes for the earth. But like that fish, we have had our blinded eyes opened and we can look above and know there's a God in heaven. And that's our heavenly fix. Thomas Watson, the old Puritan, says, The God of hope will open a window of hope in the darkest times and a door of hope in the midst of most desperate cases. The God of hope will bear up the spirits of his saints in hope against hope and this hope will never disappoint them. It shall never be said there is no peace, there is no hope until it can be said there is no God in Israel. In other words, so long as God exists, then hope exists and we know that God is the self-existent eternal one. Oh, there's that horrible feeling being cast down. There's a heavenly fix. Hope thou in God. Very quickly, finally. It's important to have a helpful focus. Horrible feeling. And a heavenly fix. But we need a helpful focus. I need a focus. Uh, I, I'm not a great one for, uh, you know, just ambling about. I need to keep myself busy. I need something to focus on. Verse number 11, there's a focus. Why art thou cast down? There's the horrible feeling. Hope thou in God. There's the heavenly fix. For I shall yet praise him who is the health of my countenance and my God. Not only did the psalmist look above, but here's the thing. The psalmist looked ahead. You see, he knew that wherever he was, that the exile was only temporary, that he would return to the temple. And you know, folks, a very simple illustration is no night has lasted forever. It's never stayed dark all night. Morning always comes again. 
And the psalmist says the day is coming when I shall be able to praise him again. Again, that word praise there, it carries the idea of public praise. It's the word used to describe praise in the temple. And he, he was saying the days are coming when I'm going to be able to return home and I'm going to get back to worshipping again. This is not the end of the line. This is not how my life's going to be forever. If the Lord spares me, then I'm going to get back to my duties. I will get back to where I was once. You know, we need a focus to help us forward, and this is it. Yes, we look above, but listen, folks, we also must look ahead. Rather than mourning over the better days of the past, we need to be motivated for the better days of the future that will come again if the Lord wills and tarries. Queen Elizabeth has only made five besides Christmas, has only made five national broadcasts in her 68-year reign. Her latest was just back there on the 5th of April, and many, many people tuned in, and she closed her speech to the nation with these words. We should take comfort that while we may have more still to endure, Better days will return. We will be with our friends again. We will be with our families again. We will meet again. And of course she uh, quoted Vera, uh, Dame Vera Lynn in that famous song from the World War. But you know we have greater words than words from our Queen. We have words from the King of Heaven. And listen folks. Life will get back to normal again. I know that this seems like this is how things are going to be forever. When we're in it, we can't see a way out of it. But listen, folks, I know that if the Lord tarries, we will get back to church again. And we must not lose sight of this. We will praise him again in public. You know... Should in this lockdown, and I don't say this flippantly, and I say this very gently, if we're promoted to glory, we will definitely praise him. We will not care about going back to church. But we've got to keep ourselves focused on the fact that we will open the church again. And listen, folks, myself and the other three elders, we're not keeping the church closed just for the sake of it. It's for everybody's best interest. And I know it's not pleasant. It's a hard decision. And we want to get back as much as anybody. But we got to go back at the right time. We've got to show wisdom. And I, I know that everybody's being so very patient. And many of you are so concerned about even going back and what that could mean. But in the bigger picture, folks, we will get back to normal again. In the meantime, like the psalmist, we must keep looking to the Lord. Twice in the psalm, countenance is mentioned. In verse 5, he says, For I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. The psalmist said he he found help in looking at the countenance of the Lord. Now, countenance is an old-fashioned word, and it means our presence, or or more specifically, the look on our face. Somebody's countenance is angry or sad or, or happy or whatever. And the psalmist in verse 5 says, I find help in his countenance. He find help by metaphorically looking into the face of God. Uh, every time he done that, the psalmist would find the smile of God resting upon him. And Paul says the same, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Look unto his countenance and we'll be helped. But in verse 11, he says that he flips it all round and he actually says, the Lord is the health of my countenance. That word health means literally salvation. You know, the countenance of so many of God's children right now is that of being downcast, discouraged, depressed. But this is what keeps us going, the fact that God is our salvation. And he is the one that saves us day by day from becoming completely overwhelmed by these circumstances. We trust the one who has not been overcome, but has overcome the world. Oh, we have that horrible feeling. We have that heavenly fix. But we have that helpful focus that's so vitally important. Maybe you don't know the Lord tonight, and maybe your soul is cast down because you only have natural eyes. You don't know the Lord as your own and personal saviour. 
Well, can I recommend him to you tonight, the man of Calvary, the Lord Jesus Christ. Hope in him this evening. Put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who loved you and gave himself for you, the one that's not willing that you should perish, the one who said, come unto me, all ye that labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He wants you to cast your burden upon him and take his free salvation. Ask the Lord tonight to forgive you. Admit that you're a sinner. Believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died for you and shed his blood upon the cross. And that there's no way to get to heaven except by him. And finally confess your sins in a simple childlike manner to the Lord. And he that cometh to him, Jesus says, I will in no wise cast out. Oh, there's hope for cast down hearts and may the Lord bless his word. To our hearts this evening. Now let's uh, do use the time uh, and get to prayer and I encourage you to do that and as we go to prayer let me give you a few prayer topics. Do continue to remember our church fellowship at this time and remember those in our church who have been affected by coronavirus, the one uh, dear member still in hospital uh, making uh, progress albeit slow but they do appreciate our prayers and pray for their family and continue to remember them before the Lord and others as well that have been affected by the virus and uh, those who are near and dear to us do pray for individuals in our church you know those who are vulnerable those who are isolated uh, those who are a little bit cast down can I encourage you uh, while we've talked about a very spiritual remedy for uh, cast down souls you know there's a very practical one and you you have all been doing it and we're thankful that lift the phone send a letter whatever you want uh, send a text message and do and keep in touch with folk because it does encourage them but let's pray for one another do pray without ceasing uh, continue to remember our key workers we have many in our church who are key workers and do please continue to pray for them can i ask you to pray for us as leaders as we continue to monitor our church situation and uh, try to take advice from the government and, and keep in line with the country and all of the decisions we have to make do continue to uh, pray for us and also for the government and I know that there's announcements being made about a pathway out of lockdown and all of this. So do please uh, pray for our government. Finally, folks, pray for those who have been bereaved in our church in recent days. And just on that particular note, I just want to inform all of our uh, members and friends of our church fellowship that our dear sister Joy King uh, went to be with the Lord this morning in the early hours of this morning. Joy was a lady who loved the Lord greatly and who served the Lord well and uh, she has gone home to be with her saviour so do please remember joy's family at this time as they grieve uh, and do uh, take them upon your hearts now let's get to prayer i'll lead off and then i'll sign out and leave you to pray the remainder of the night let's pray together our dear lord and loving heavenly father we bow in your presence this evening and Father, we have to say our hearts have been blessed by your word tonight. Not the words of man, but by the word of God. Because we thank you that your word is so very relevant. And Lord, it has touched us, Lord. And we have to admit we're human. And we do get cast down. And I know there are those in our own fellowship, Lord, that are cast down tonight. I pray for them, Father, and I pray that you will encourage them. Pray, Lord, even though it's a horrible feeling that they would look for that heavenly fix that they can hope in God, that we're not like the world, that we have that double vision, that we can see a God by faith in heaven who's on the throne. Help us to hope in you, O God. When our faith is weak, strengthen us, our Father. But Lord, help us to focus on the fact that if it be your will, and Lord, if you tarry, uh, that we will be back again. We shall again peer, appear before the Lord like the psalmist. Lord, help us to set that as our focus and to work towards that and to anticipate the better days that are yet to come. Father, we remember all before you that need our prayers at this time. Those in our church fellowship that are sick. We think of the one in hospital and we thank you for the progress that they are making and we pray you'll continue to bless them, Father, and the progress. And Lord, we pray for the doctors and the nurses and the medical team that, Lord, they'll continue to know the wisdom of God. And Father, uh, we do remember uh, others in our church fellowship that, that have been affected and we ask your blessing upon them. And Lord, our key workers need you as well, Father. And we thank you for every one of them and we do commend them lovingly onto you but lord for the bereaved this evening you you know those on our hearts and we do think 
Lord of our sister Joy and we thank you that she is with the Lord this evening which is far better but we do remember her grieving family this evening that you will draw graciously near and others Father tonight that are uh, mourning the loss of loved ones in recent days Lord we do pray that you'll strengthen them in these days. Remember our government Father you know the decisions they have to make and how difficult it is but you've exhorted us to pray for those that are in authority over us. We do that just now Father. And we ask, Lord, you'll take of our thanks for this time that we have spent together in your word. And we pray you'll bless your people as they pray the remainder of this evening. In Jesus' name. Amen.